here you are in the middle of nature, in the middle of these, you know, rolling candy striped badlands that are just bursting with the bones and teeth of these ancient creatures. And there's something just very satisfying about that, about having that sense of adventure, about being able to walk around in those landscapes to get away from the whole bustle of the world of everything that, you know, humans are doing to change our planet so much to get, you know, to feel like you're getting away from that and to be able to walk around and just find these incredible fossils. That's something that makes paleontology very unique. And and that's one of the things that gets a lot of people interested in paleontology, especially a lot of students, just being able to have the chance to go out to amazing places around the world and discover things. Greetings, future fossils. This is Michael Garfield welcoming you to another episode of the podcast that explores our place in time. And right now, my place in time is... In southwest Austin, where I sit at the bottom of a shallow intercontinental sea. About 70 million years ago, a now extinct volcano in what's now the Blunt Creek Preserve, where I watched the lunar eclipse in 2014, was erupting regularly in a frothy brew of giant swimming reptiles flying reptiles, and the occasional lost dinosaur. Not to mention giant cephalopods and giant sea turtles. I mean, come on. Anyway, I'm going on like this because this is the real me. And this is how I've always been. And while it's not been entirely evident on a show that has preoccupied itself with the future and the bleeding edge, I am a man lost to lost worlds retro romantic and ready to retreat into the age of dinosaurs which i must say steve brasati captures awesomely in his new book and i am super glad to have that guy who's sort of an alternate version of me or maybe i'm just nuts more simply, possibly just captivated by Steve's warmth and generosity and easygoingness, totally approachable, makes it completely obvious why anyone would just love this stuff. But first, I want to thank Bubba and Tim Gregg, the two new Patreon supporters this week, both of you. My blessings and appreciation, as well as the other 115. Y'all are paying my rent now, or just about, (laughs) and it's wonderful, and uh, it's really helping out a lot in terms of my ability to make this show. I have a kind of stretch goal on the page where I talk about how I want to make more videos with content from this show, do time-lapse, scientific, psychedelic illustration stuff, and pair it to music and take excerpts from awesome episodes like this one and the the captivating riffs that my guests go on and whip it all together into something magical and put that out a couple times a month. But if I'm going to put that much time into all this, then I could really use your help. So anyway, riff over, patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. I appreciate you. Also, everybody who has rated and reviewed this show on any platform, it's on everything these days, which is delightful. But yeah, the marks you make, the traces that you leave, your tracers in the hologram, they are appreciated by unborn archaeologists who have to find this show through tags and group referrals. Can you even imagine how mulchy human history is going to be in a couple hundred years. Good God. But anyway, I digress. This is an episode about dinosaurs, folks. About our love for dinosaurs and the ancient world and how we are currently living through a golden age of dinosaur science. So in the words of fictional computer engineer John Arnold, hold on to your butts because this episode with Steve Brusati of the University of Edinburgh about his new book, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, is super wonderful. 
and I'm glad I get to share it with you. Well, dude, it's a pleasure to finally get you on the horn. Yes, it's... I know. I'm glad we could, uh, <laughs> we could finally sync up, but it's good. And thanks for being really flexible yeah. with it and everything. And yeah. Of course. Well, I mean, you've written a really interesting book. I mean, I'm biased, obviously, <laughs> but I'm really glad to see, uh, you know, I've been out, of, I've kind of been out of the game for years and I'm, I'm glad to see a book that has really captured the evolution of paleontology as a science uh, in the 21st century and the way that it is, um, you know, you really told the story of this science as a global enterprise. And it's it's a really, you know, it's it's a captivating work, man. So thanks. Good, for I'm I'm, I'm, well, thanks. I'm, I'm glad you feel that way, you know, because it's kind of in this awkward phase in the few weeks before it's going to be released, not really knowing, you know, what readers are going to think of it. And I'm just... Uh, kind of a little bit antsy just uh just waiting and hoping people will say things like that and so you know i'm glad i'm glad you think that way and, you know and i certainly tried in the book to um you know as much as i could in like a pop science book to try to to tell not only the you know evolution of dinosaur story but like the evolution of how we study dinosaurs and and how the field has developed and certainly how it's become really, really, really global and very diverse and how, you know, the diversity of of people that are studying dinosaurs now, particularly uh, younger people from all over the world, uh, women and men, um, you know, a lot of a lot of new young Chinese scientists, um, particularly, but also a lot of homegrown scientists in South America and in Eastern Europe and other places has, you know, really resulted in this golden age of paleontology so i'm glad you i'm glad you feel that 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 kind of stuff came across <laughs> well yeah man i mean and you know the story is for me at least such a personal story because you know you talk about como bluff in, in the chapter on the jurassic and that's where yeah. i did all of my field work with robert uh -huh. bacher as a teenager cool and yeah. And it just like reading the section about Como Bluff and the Bone Wars like brought me to tears because I was like, this is <laughs> this is it. This is the you know, this is my like holy land, you know, and just to connect through that, through that sense of, of personal resonance with the experience of being out there in the field and doing this work and then to connect it through all of your stories about the people that are, you know, the, the paleontologists working through the financial collapse in Spain and, you know, the roughnecks and cowboys coming at it, you know, the way the accidental discoveries, you know, of Chinese work crews and just like yeah. how, how extraordinarily diverse and multicultural this really is, although that's not necessarily the, the place to focus this whole conversation. But. Yeah, no, but I'm glad you're seeing that because really, I mean, we are in this golden age uh, now, you know, where there is a new species being found, you know, about once a week on average. And I mean, that's really incredible when you think about it. And that pace has been going on for like a decade now. And that's just nuts when you think about somebody finding a new dinosaur once a week somewhere around the world. And it really is because the field has changed a lot. You know, in those Bone Wars days, there were just limited places where people are looking for dinosaurs. And, you know, it was only certain people who were looking for dinosaurs. It was only people from certain types of, you know, often very gilded academic institutions. It was almost completely men. Um, and, you know, it was people mostly in North America and Europe. And then occasionally, you know, you would have some of these scientists make connections with you know, people in South America or in Asia, but in kind of an imperialistic kind of way. And, and, and that's just changed so much. And it's no coincidence that we're in this golden age now. And we're especially seeing dinosaurs being found all over the world because it's not, you know, just some some distinguished professor from Yale that's, you know, going out to, to China and, uh, you know, rolls in and, and, and goes out in the field and hires a bunch of people to dig things up for them. It's not. It's, it's young Chinese students and it's people being trained at Chinese universities and it's men and women. And it's, you know, it's, it's people from really across 
the, the spectrum. And, uh, you know, I just think that's really neat. And I think that bodes well for the future of the field because, you know, there's still a lot to be found out there. There's still tons of dinosaurs to be found and more and more young people are getting trained. So I think, you know, although dinosaurs are old and these bones are ancient and they've been around, you know, for tens, hundreds of millions of years, uh, there's still so much more to, to learn. So uh, reading this book, it, something occurred to me that, you know, I'm, I'm also reading it, uh, at the same time Ian Golden and Chris Kutarna's book, The Age of Discovery, which is a, comparing the rhyme, the historical rhyme between our age and the European Renaissance. And, you know, one, okay. of, one of the one of the claims, you know, one of the things that they're investigating in that book is how new trade routes and new communications technologies open up new uh new economic exchanges internationally and how over the last 25 years or so international trade between what we call developing nations what we used to call the third world and the industrialized west has just exploded and like you're saying about these countries cultivating their own paleontologists suddenly there's commerce coming in on that end and so you know there's you know you if you intersect that with this this new golden age of paleontology it seems like it's worth noting that there's a double rarity going on here with finding a dinosaur fossil which is it 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 has to take place under the correct fossil conditions right but the right conditions to be preserved but then it also has to be somewhere where it can be discovered it can be like eroded out of the ground and so you know i think it's worth noting in this story of paleontology that Dinosaur fossil discovery as a history seems to go along with economic development and economic exploration. Like all the bone wars in the American West were because we were moving out West. We were laying rail and pulling apart hillsides to lay rail. And now this explosion of Chinese dinosaurs seems coincident with the explosion of Chinese affluence and, you know, their, their sort of move into the global marketplace through international trade. So I don't know if there's anything to say about that, but it's just, there's something about breaking ground, you know, and like literally pulling the ground apart that as we've come to an age where human beings are sort of repeating the story of the dinosaurs and dominating every continent that they've come back to us through that literal disc, you know, literally our, our disruption of our own geological substrate. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree totally with that. That's, you know, and well said, and I, you should write this up. This would be a great kind of, you know, history, philosophy of science type of book. So I think you're absolutely right. Because um, when, you know, when you think back to the Bone Wars, uh, so many of those discoveries literally were made by railway men. Uh, and they were made as the railways were being laid, but they were also sometimes made by, you know, the people who were working on the railways that just kind of went exploring around. And then when Cope and Marsh needed an army of collectors to go out and find things so they could one-up each other, I mean, they hired a lot of these railway guys and a lot of these roughnecks that, that hung out uh, along the railways. And those railways being arteries that took people and goods and, and culture kind of out into the West, uh, a lot of problems, of course, you know, a lot of, of, of you know, uh, deep, uh, dark history when it comes to what happened to, you know, Native Americans, for instance. Uh, but as far as um, the science goes and as far as discovery goes, uh, those railways just open things up and, uh, you know, in a metaphorical sense, but also in a very, very, very literal sense with these dinosaurs being found. And it's true in China, you know, now it's, it's so many of the discoveries are, are made by farmers in northeastern China as they're working their land, as they're working their land more, as the demand for crops increases. Also, of course, as some of those feathered dinosaurs have become monetized and they can sell them to museums, you know, they'll in intentionally work even more land. But in southern China, um, where this Pinocchio Rex dinosaur, Chongosaurus, that I talk about in the book, where that was found, you know, it was a, a, a workman that found it uh, in his digger, you know, using his backhoe, just scraping out 
uh, stuff that looks like dirt is really poorly consolidated rock from the late Cretaceous, this red rock, mudstones that were formed in this this ancient um, kind of 66, 67, 68 million year old, very tropical uh, forested uh, environment full of dinosaur bones. And, and it was digging up the earth, laying the foundation for a building that exposed that skeleton and lots of other skeletons. Um, and, you know, the same has been happening in other parts of the world. And uh, that's what makes paleontology, you know, one of the things that makes it very interesting is it's, of course, a, you know, a hardcore science. And we're always using the latest tools and technologies and techniques to study the fossils, whether it's cat scanning them or using computer animations to study how they moved uh, or, you know, super high powered microscopes to figure out their color. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a discovery science and you have to dig these bones out of the ground somehow. And uh, that means there's always adventure and it means it's the science and a lot of ways is always tied to um, just the broader development of, of societies and, and cultures. So, you know, on that note, on the note of the adventure, I think it's great that you you tell the story of, you know, coming up as a student of Paul Serino at the University of Chicago, because, I mean, that guy is you know, without question, one of the like legendary rock star adventure paleontologists. And I, you know, I would love to just uh, anchor this in your story about coming up as a student and, you know, how you, how you became enamored with this field and what drew you into it. And, you know, the story of your, your, you know, early days. I mean, a lot of this stuff is in the book, but it's just such a, I think it's good for people, you know, to understand what what drives your passion for this because you know sometimes people just don't i don't know we've never had a dinosaur episode on this show bizarrely enough <laughs> um and so dinosaurs as a sort of big and scary thing i think are fairly easy to connect to but there's this whole other part of paleontology which is the actual experience of the work of it that i find so amazing and i'd love to hear you speak to that yeah so you know kind of my story of how i got into paleontology is i came to the field as a teenager, you know, I, that's when I became interested in dinosaurs and that's when I became obsessed really with dinosaurs and with fossils. Um, a lot of kids get into it a lot earlier. You know, I'm, I'm always going into classrooms and meeting all these kindergartners and uh, first graders, second graders that just love dinosaurs and they know all the names and they can pronounce all the names and their teachers have no idea how they know how to pronounce these names. And it's just something that's so common that's in the U.S. It's here in the U.K. I I was just in a classroom in Scotland, you know, here in Edinburgh just a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, one of the more, I guess we would say, deprived areas of the city, but, a, a, you know, a very beautiful school and, uh, you know, a couple of classes of, of second graders. They were just obsessed with dinosaurs. They knew so much. And, and, and. I wasn't one of those kids. I came to it later, but uh, my youngest brother was um, really into dinosaurs. So his bedroom is basically a dinosaur museum, and uh, he had posters all over the walls, and he had all kinds of toys, lots of Jurassic Park paraphernalia, and uh, and you know little dinosaur bones he'd buy at rock shops and that kind of stuff. But uh, more than anything, he had a great library. He had over a hundred books on dinosaurs. Um, if, you know, he would be the sort of person that with, with my book now, he'd probably be the first person to pre-order the thing, you know, a year before it was going to be published. He was just that into it. And that rubbed off on me. And, and when I was a teenager, you know, I just kind of through osmosis um, became enthralled with dinosaurs. And because I came to it a little bit later, I think I wasn't so obsessed in that collector sort of way that a lot of kids are you know i wasn't the one who's really caring about memorizing the names and all of that but i really just became enamored with evolution with how the earth changes over time with how dinosaurs are clues that help us understand that story and not only dinosaurs other fossils as well i've just read voraciously about pretty much any type of of fossil or books on evolution, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so by the time I was, you know, kind of sophomore in high school or so, I knew I really wanted to study paleontology as a, a career. You know, I didn't know very much at that point about how difficult academic careers can be and how few jobs there are and all of the things now that probably would have scared me off if I would have really known <laughs> what I was getting into. <laughs> but I, I went into it at night and, and I really wanted to go to the University of Chicago because I grew up you know, around Chicago. I grew up about 75 miles southwest of Chicago in, in a, a small town called Ottawa, which is out past the suburbs, you know, is out in kind of 
classic pure Midwestern territory, flat land, corn, bean fields all the way to the horizon in all directions, um, but close enough to Chicago that it was kind of, you know, the big city was like a spiritual home, I guess. And uh, I just really wanted to go to college there. And I would read all the time in the newspapers in the Chicago Tribune and Chicago Sun-Times, but even in our hometown newspaper in Ottawa, um, stuff about this guy in Chicago, Paul Serino, this paleontologist who is always traveling around the world, going on these expeditions for months at a time in exotic places. I mean, really exotic places, the Sahara Desert. You know, that's where he went a lot in, in the 90s and into the early 2000s, you know, right around the time I was getting in, interested in paleontology. But Paul's also done work in South America and he's done work in Australia and he's done work in, in China and, of course, in, in Western North America. He's been almost everywhere and he was just bringing back these incredible dinosaurs. And it was thrilling to read about these new discoveries in the news. So that's what really motivated me to to go and work with Paul. It just seemed to be the perfect deal being able to go to a university that I, you know, it was a great university that was close enough to home, but not too close, uh, that had this, uh, you know, world famous swashbuckling paleontologist uh, there. And so, um, you know, I ended up going to Chicago and, um, you know, I met Paul a few times when I was in high school at some public talks that he gave. So I got to know him a little bit and we exchanged some emails and stuff when I was in high school. And he was very nice to me, very generous, always replied. You know, I, I really felt his enthusiasm. And anybody who knows Paul just you know knows how enthusiastic he is about dinosaurs. And um, and so when I, I started in Chicago, I you know started working in his lab and, and just starting out with the basics, learning how to prepare and conserve fossils and mold and cast fossils. And I learned pretty quickly that that wasn't really where my strengths were. <laughs> you know, I'm not a very artistic person. I, I can't really draw very well or sculpt or, you know, I'm just not that kind of visually artistic person. And a lot of fossil preparation really is an art. And Paul employed some of the world's best preparators and they tried to teach me. And I, again, I learned the basics, but I realized pretty quickly that, um, you know, what really got me was, the research side of things, you know, being given fossils that had just come out of the desert and um, fossils that nobody had really studied before, fossils that were a bit of a mystery that uh, there's maybe some inclination what they were, but they needed to be properly studied and figuring out what they were and, and what they said about evolution, really treating them as clues, like in a in a detective game almost, and then, uh, you know, writing scientific papers about them. I, I've always liked to write, and, and so the, just that side of, of studying these things like a detective and then having to put that all together and present it. Uh, I, I just fell in love with that. So Paul was, you know, very, very generous. I mean, I was 20 years old when he gave me my first fossils to, to describe and to study. These were fossils that he brought back from the Sahara. I mean, things that he literally, him and his crew, you know, risked their lives uh, bringing back because there were some real adventures they had. And, you know, they not only long expeditions in a very inhospitable place, but, you know, they ran into bandits and they would have to sometimes go through war zones and, you know, the sorts of, of stories I can only imagine, which is why hopefully Paul will, will write a book, uh, you know, someday <laughs> where he tells these stories. But he gave me some of these fossils to work on, 20 years old, and, and you know, I just ate it up, and I loved it, and I wrote up my first paper then, and, and this was this dinosaur, Carcardonosaurus guidensis, um, you know, a, a new species of, of giant uh, theropod from uh, Niger and the Sahara Desert, you know, it lived in the middle part of the Cretaceous kind of 90 to 100 million years ago or so, um, maybe a little bit older. And, uh, you know, this was one of these dinosaurs that um, was a somewhat primitive theropod, but it grew to sizes about the same as, as T-Rex. So it was, you know, kind of bus size, you know, 40 feet long or so, weighed a few tons, a real top predator. And that was just an an amazing thrill to be able to study something like that for the first time, my first experience with real dinosaurs. And then Paul gave me more specimens to study. And, you know, by the time I finished undergrad, we already had several papers we were writing together. And it was just a, you know, a great start to my career. And I was very fortunate at that stage to have a, a mentor who, um, you know, although Paul wasn't the sort of person who I saw every day, he wasn't the sort of person that was always in his office or always in his lab. He wasn't the sort of person that, you know, really took me under his wing in the sense of, of you know, being there all the time as some fatherly figure. He was a sort of mentor that gave me amazing stuff to work on. And, and, and um, you know, I got to work with it. And, uh, and that was just really what I needed at that point. Um, so, 
that was the first, I would say, really big lucky break that I had. And if I didn't have, you know, Paul as a mentor at that stage, if I was at another university um, or maybe there wasn't such an active paleontology lab, I don't really know how my career would have unfolded. I know how your career would have unfolded. (laughs) You might have spent, uh, you know, 10 years aimlessly milling around the festival circuit before reading this book by this guy from the University of Chicago that made you question everything that you'd chosen in your adult life. But it's like <laughs> I mean, when you kind of think of <laughs> I mean, it is, it is really because I mean, you know, I told you this over email, but I think it's, a, you know, it's a trip for me and probably an item of curiosity for the listeners to know. I mean, I almost went to the University of Chicago. I would have been in the same classes with you. And I got a scholarship to the University of Kansas where the head of paleontology, Larry Martin, really didn't give a shit about dinosaurs and (laughs) stuck me in an independent study where he wanted me using the original monograph on Camarasaurus to reconstruct the entire neck through uh, 3D wax sculptures used as, as, you know, to create molds for a resin cast. And it was this whole thing about uh, he was trying to get me to do the same process that he'd done on the skeleton of Archaeopteryx to to make his claims about that. And I thought it was just ridiculous and antiquated and there's no way that you can generate an accurate three-dimensional model based on the drawings. And I was right and the project never even completed. And I found out through this whole process that apparently he was just trying to make a model that he could like profit on because John yeah. Gurchy, the, the illustrator whose photorealistic dinosaur paintings are the, the portrait of Sue the Tyrannosaurus at the Field Museum and Right. covers of National Geographic, had slipped through Larry Martin's fingers years before. I had gone on to be this this extraordinary <laughs> painter and had never remained sort of within the wheelhouse of KU paleontology. And Larry thought it was a mistake. And so at any rate, it's just, yeah. it's just fascinating wow. how different the mentorship, how much of a difference that makes. I got to give props to, uh, to Robert Bacher, you know, who was my role model and inspiration from the ages of like two until I was an adult, but he was never really properly affiliated with a research institution at that time. And it, you know, it wasn't really the kind of, the kind of container that would have, you know, facilitated a a career track in this science. So it's, I'm really, uh, yeah, Yeah, kind of wistful about it. It is. It's something that is, very interesting to think about and in yeah that wistful way as I can you know as I can gather from you because you never know you know so much of of life as a scientist I think is a lot like evolution and earth history I mean it's very contingent you know everything we know really about evolution Mm. says there's no plan you know life didn't start out you know 4.5 billion years ago thinking well one day we're going to evolve into dinosaurs. You know, the first dinosaurs (laughs) didn't start thinking, hey, one day we're going to grow feathers and become birds. I mean, evolution happens. It happens in the moment and it can only work on what's happened before. And there's a whole process of chance and contingency with it, even down to, you know, whatever random genetic mutations might be out there. And, you know, that's the whole argument of Stephen Jay Gould, of course, in the book Wonderful Life, which is one of the the books that I uh, you know, read when I was a teenager, I read pretty much everything Gould wrote. And a lot of those books inspired me a lot because they were more than just books on dinosaurs. They were they were stories. They were stories about evolution. Um, and I think from a, you know, a mentorship side, it's the same thing. You know, uh, so much as a researcher um, comes down to the people you work with, the opportunities you get and you know, it's I, I just know that I've been very fortunate in that category. And, and that's true at every stage. I mean, I got started out really well with Paul. I have a mentor who is such a famous dinosaur hunter who, you know, saw in me the passion I had um, and and gave me the opportunity to study real dinosaur bones with him. I mean, that was the first. But then you know, I had some great luck in, in getting a scholarship to go to the UK to do a master's degree. And so I lived in Bristol for two years and I did the master's course there. And I had another great supervisor, Mike Benton, who is a very famous paleontologist. He's written a lot of dinosaur books and he's very, very active. He probably publishes more papers than any other paleontologist. And he's a real evolutionary thinker. You know, he thinks big about um, evolution and how the earth changes and, and uh, you know, diversification over time. And so, you know, he was somebody who just by being around him, he opened up my perspective into, you know, more than just dinosaurs as, as 
new fossils to describe and identify and figure out in that detective game, but thinking about them as even bigger clues and even bigger stories, things that you can use to actually test hypotheses, big hypotheses about how life has evolved. And also many of Mike's students, his PhD students at the time, people like Graham Lloyd and, and you know, Mike's postdoc, Marcello Ruda, they were great mentors to me at that stage. Um, and then from there, I went on to do my PhD in New York, and, and I got to work with Mark Norell there, and that was just oh, shit. That was amazing because Mark is, you know, a very eminent paleontologist, of course, uh, and Mark was just fantastic. And I, you know, I have a passage about him in the book where I, I needle him a little bit because he's funny. Anybody who knows Mark, uh, you know, knows he, he's just a hilarious guy. He's a great storyteller, you know, so I needle him a little bit there, but, but I also say in there that, you know, he's the best kind of supervisor. He's exactly the supervisor I needed as a PhD student. I mean, Mark also traveled around the world uh, collecting fossils. He's led these expeditions to the Gobi Desert for the past 25 years or so, every year bringing back new dinosaurs to New York. And so when I started as a PhD student, he handed me a nearly complete skeleton of a Tyrannosaur said, here you go. It's probably a new species. It's yours. This will be chapter one of your thesis. Let's describe the thing. Let's figure it out. And so he continued that way for the next four and a half years as I was his student. And and he was somebody who also wasn't, you know, the most hands-on mentor. He was, and uh, I say in the book, you know, he he's the kind of guy who um, is never a micromanager, never a credit stealer. These things happen sometimes in science. It happens sometimes when you're in big labs or you're working with very eminent people. But Mark was somebody who just was there and you know, gave us kick-ass fossils to work on, stepped aside, let us work on them, was there with anything we needed, supported us financially, really great. I mean, I got to travel around the world to all these different museums, uh, and Mark paid for it. He paid for it on some of his grants. He paid for it on, you know, internal money from the American Museum. So I got to meet people all over the world simply because Mark made it happen. And, you know, I did field work with Mark. You know, we 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 did a lot of field work in Romania together. We still work in Romania together with a, just an amazing group of colleagues there who I talk about in the book. This guy, Machas Vremer, who's maybe the best fossil collector I've ever known. And uh, Zoltan Chiki Saba there is a, a, a younger professor. And, and so, you know, Mark opened up those doors for me. Uh, and he never, ever, ever, ever lets any of his students pay for beer. <laughs> it's uh-huh. just a thing. And so I try to <laughs> take the same approach as, you know, now that I'm running my lab. Um, but I've been just incredibly fortunate. And, and uh, you know, I hope that comes across in the book, um, the respect that I have for the people who have mentored me and advised me and the people that have really given me the space and the opportunity uh, to develop as a scientist, uh, because, you know, no, nobody in science ever does anything alone. You know, m- maybe in, in mathematics or something, you can be a lone genius and, and figure out some great proof just, you know, sitting in your boxers at home in the dark or whatever. But like <laughs> most science is not like that. I mean, it's collaborative. You work with teams. You need teams, uh, and you need good mentorship when when you're a student. So now that I run my own lab, I just really hope um, I can provide for my students what a lot of my mentors did to me. Yeah, I mean, there's just to give people a little window into this. The the page in the book where you talk about Mark Norell, you say. He dresses like a hipster version of Andy Warhol, holds court in a majestic office overlooking Central Park, boasts a collection of ancient Buddhist art that puts many museums to shame and brings portable fridges into the desert so he can make sushi while doing field work. Is it enough to qualify as the single coolest individual in the world? I'll let others judge. This is because I mentioned a bit <laughs> earlier there that a few years ago, the Wall Street Journal published an article on Mark with the headline, The Coolest Dude Alive. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you figure, well, Mark's pretty cool and I love Mark. I don't know, you know, in a world <laughs> where people like Mick Jagger and uh, Slash and others are, are still with us. I don't know if Mark Norell's the single coolest dude in the world, but... Um, He's up there. <laughs> I mean, it is the New York Times. So, uh, you know, this something you said earlier, to switch the angle a little here, something you said earlier about growing up in the Midwest, uh, you know, just outside of Chicago. And, you know, I grew up uh, just outside of Kansas City. And walking around as a kid, I was just always thinking about how I was at the bottom of an ancient seafloor. You know, like everywhere I looked is, you know, there's there's like a hundred or two hundred foot column of water overhead. And now that I'm down here in in Austin, Texas, you know, at the bottom of a Cretaceous seabed, 
you know it's it's still that sense and there's that sense uh of place in time that this particular podcast is totally preoccupied with but something i'd love to hear you speak to because there is a way that a paleontologist moves through the world that is evident in your book that is <laughs> you know wherever you are on the planet at any given time like how old the rocks are underneath you and you have a sense for the the world that was alive at the time that those rocks were being deposited so there's a historicity it's like having an, a sense that other people don't have the sense of, of of a place in what people now call the big story you know the history of life in our cosmos and I think it would be cool to have you talk a little bit about what it's like to live in that kind of a situatedness. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, I've never really thought about it that much before in that way. But I think you're right. You know, when I travel around, you know, it's not like I know everywhere I go the age of every rock or whatever. But but I'm, I'm always thinking about, you know, where is this area? Where was it during the Mesozoic era? You know, where was it when there when Pangaea was still around? Um, what kind of environments were there? What kind of dinosaurs lived there? I, I always have a sense, I think, wherever I travel now, of kind of what dinosaurs have been found in that part of the world. And uh, I think, you know, I've heard geologists talk about this before, just having this sort of perspective when you travel around on the earth of looking at landscapes and being able to see the long history of those landscapes, being able to see in the shapes of hills and the types of rocks that are exposed and the colors of the landscape, being able to see deep, distant pasts, reconstructing vanished worlds. And I think that's part of the magic of sciences like paleontology and geology. I mean, we're, again, hardcore sciences. We're always using the latest technologies to study rocks and fossils, but we're also historical scientists uh, as well. I mean, we are historians. We are using this evidence that we find to tell stories about how the world has changed over time. I mean, rigorous, robust, scientific stories. We hypothesize things, we test things, but when it comes down to it, we're getting at history. And that does entail you know, developing this ability to see history in a landscape and to have that mindset uh, that probably nobody who's not a geologist or a paleontologist thinks like that. So I'm sure we just think really strangely. And uh, growing up in the Midwest, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying, you know, especially uh, just with the landscapes today in the Midwest. I mean, it's just not the most inspiring place. And that's no <laughs> offense to where I grew up. I love where I grew up. I go back all the time and my family still lives there. I mean, it was a very safe, very pleasant uh, place to grow up, my hometown. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I got a great education there. I had great teachers there. But ultimately, when you do grow up in the middle of kind of thousands of miles of unbroken flatness, um, <laughs> it, it's not so inspiring. And, and I think um, whether that makes it harder to become a geologist or a paleontologist if you grew up in those areas, maybe, or maybe it, it makes you want to study these things even more because, you know, you, you, you can start to envision different worlds. But, you know, I, I collected a lot of fossils when I was a teenager around where I lived, and there, there's never been a dinosaur found in Illinois. There are dinosaurs in Kansas, at least, um, and there are dinosaurs in Missouri, at least. But in <laughs> Illinois, there's never been a single dinosaur that's been found. And most of the rocks are much older than, than the age of dinosaurs. They were rocks that were laid down back in um, the Pennsylvanian and Mississippian mm -hmm. Uh, periods, the age of the great coal swamps, where you had these vast forests of 100 foot tall trees. And as they would die, they would fall into swamps and they would clog up these swamps and get buried and get compressed over time and turned into the coal that powered really so much of the American Industrial Revolution. The coal that was mined in, in, in central Illinois that brought my great grandparents over from Italy on the lookout for jobs, you know, back in the late 1800s, they went to work in the coal mines of, of northern Illinois. It brought them, you know, halfway around the world. And, and, you know, to think of those things as fossils, because coal is a fossil, but to just, you know, think about that sort of connection is a really cosmic thing. <laughs> and that's the, the kind of stuff that's in Illinois. And there's even older stuff. There's stuff, you know, this Pennsylvanian, the coals, they're kind of 280, 290, 300 million years old or so, but there's much older fossils from 
the uh, Ordovician and the Silurian, you know, corals and crinoids and brachiopods and all of these classic animals that lived back when the Midwest was covered in water. And I loved collecting those things as a, as a teenager. They weren't dinosaurs, but I wasn't just obsessed with dinosaurs as a teenager. You know, I liked all fossils. And it was an amazing thing to be able to go out not far where you're from and find these objects that you know, you dig them out yourself, you know, you're using a hammer and a chisel and you're taking them out of the rock and nobody had ever, you know, seen them before. I mean, you're the first person who ever has ever laid eyes on these things and they are unspeakably old, hundreds of millions of years old. And there's just something indescribable about that feeling of finding and holding and appreciating, trying to appreciate those kinds of fossil objects. And that never gets old. Like a new fossil discovery never gets old. So I take my crews up, my students, you know, every year to different places in Scotland to look for dinosaurs. And, you know, we find not a a ton of dinosaurs. It's not really a hot spot in Scotland. Um, It's emerging. We're finding more and more, but this is not Como Bluff. You know, this is not (laughs) Liaoning, China. Um, But, uh, you know, we're always finding new things. And every time we find something, whether it's, you know, a bone or whether it's a footprint, uh, there's there's just a magical feeling just thinking about that object once being part of an animal that lived so long ago that looked so different from anything alive today or a footprint being left by an animal like that walking around interacting with its world a world of hundreds of millions of years ago mm, yeah yeah you know because one of the things of you know that you're 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 getting into that uh that altered time perception that i found so alluring i, I remember coming back from wyoming at the end of the summer and going back to high school and being like, I've got to remember this feeling, this feeling of, you know, because in most cases, I mean, obviously, you know, we've already talked about, you know, urban development, pulling out new dinosaur sites and, and that kind of thing as we, you know, covered the surface of our planet with concrete. But yeah. um, by and large, most dinosaur work ever, and I think probably still today, is done out in these sort of remote, inaccessible, rather kind of like inhospitable even hostile badlands like the Gobi Desert, you know, um, and there's something about, you know, getting out into those places that is already kind of uh, consciousness altering, you know, getting out of the city and out of, you know, like Doug Rushkoff in his book Present Shock talks about how our sense of time perception has changed as the, the city clock has become more and more precise and divided our sense of time into finer and finer increments to the point now where, you know, human society is actually moving at a, at a pace that's faster than we can actually perceive with our nervous systems, all these high frequency trading algorithms and computer processes. And when you get out of that, when you get out into the, into, you know, the, the badlands or, you know, out on some ranch in East Wyoming or whatever, then it's easy somehow i think you know kind of like what you were suggesting about the the sort of boring midwestern landscape like it's it's easy to slip out of our normal sense of time and into this sort of like you said like a cosmic appreciation for how this you know the the vastness of it and then also somehow the the continuity of that vastness like you know when you mention bob bacher in the book you know you talk about the fact that he was, uh, you know, kind of also a, an amateur preacher, you know, that yeah. he, he, the, the, the guy taught the Talmud in Hebrew and would go around, you know, saying, you know, weird, just non sequitur stuff about the Bible, like how the, the Latin translation in Genesis ex nihilo was actually a mistranslation mistrans- from a word that meant formlessness and there was never nothing. And he would go off on these, these rants that out there, with this huge dude who looked like a desert patriarch with the crazy beard and the wild look in his eye, um, you know, it felt totally appropriate out in those spaces to be having a kind of a religious experience through science. Yeah. And so, you know, I met Bob Bacher when I was a teenager. He came up to the Burpee Museum in Rockford, Illinois, you know, this gem of a museum in what's really a, a declining Rust Belt city, as much as I hate to say it. Rockford is 
you know, an old uh, steel town, an old industrial town, and it's hanging on, it's doing better than it was, uh, but they have one of the great natural history museums in the Midwest, and they have an event every year, it's called Paleo Fest, and it's just been the 20th anniversary just last month, and it was really cool, they invited me back to do the keynote this time, which was so much fun, because I went there religiously, you know, every year when I was in high school and college, and that's where I first met Paul Serino, that's where I first met Mark Norell, and many other scientists, including Bob Bakker, and I mean, he was just a legend, I I read his book, The Dinosaur Heresies, you know, when I was a teenager. He published it in the 80s, and it was very much, you know, the literary treatment, the first literary treatment of this new image of dinosaurs as active, energetic, dynamic creatures. A very, very, very important book. And um, I think, you know, maybe, you know, I don't want to rank dinosaur books, but as far as pop science dinosaur books go, The Dinosaur Heresies is, is really probably the ultimate at least for the last, you know, 30 or 40 years or so. So hopefully I got in, in, in my book, I, I got the description of Bob okay for you. Um, <laughs> he's, he's, a hard, he's in some ways he's, you know, easy to describe because he has so many, um, you know, big, bold parts of his personality and the way he dresses and the way he talks. In another way, though, he's kind of difficult, I think, to describe because he seems like you're making him up. You can just over <laughs> hyperbolize. You feel like, oh, my God, like whoever's reading this probably thinks, you know, you're just making up this character and you have your thesaurus open in front of you and you're trying too hard. I mean, if if a novelist invented a character like Bob Bakker, I, I think – you know, that novelist would be kind of laughed, laughed out of the, you know, New York Times book review or whatever, saying this is guy's not possible. He was um, he was a sort of uh, satiric caricature in the second Jurassic Park film. The guy that they had right. playing the paleontologist actually shadowed him in the field for a couple weeks. So. Yeah. And he is a very important person, obviously hugely important person in the field with the dinosaur renaissance and bringing that new image of dinosaurs uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And, you know, a lot of Bob's work, as you know, you know, working with Bob at Homo Bluff and other places, I mean, he's a great explorer as well. I mean, he's clearly a genius. Um, anybody who is teaching the Talmud in, in Hebrew and is going into, uh, you know, Bible translations in different languages and stuff, I mean, that's not kind of a normal intellect right there. Uh, but he's also an explorer. And getting back to your point about, you know, the landscapes and being out, you know, in the world looking for fossils, that's one of the great things of this science is Again, a hardcore science, lots of techniques, lots of technology, a historical science, so we are historians, but it's also a discovery and exploration science. I and mean, we are going out there trying to find new things. And usually that means going to inhospitable or isolated corners of the world, because as you say, you're not going to find a dinosaur under several feet of concrete. You're not going to find a dinosaur uh, underneath a skyscraper. Humans, you know, we've been building a lot of stuff that have covered up a lot of dinosaurs. So if you want to find dinosaurs, you need, you, know, you do usually need to go, well, to places where rocks are exposed. And a lot of times that is deserts and badlands. And so one of my favorite places is New Mexico, the Four Corners area of New Mexico. And mm. for several years now, I've been working with you know, one of my best friends in, in paleontology, Tom Williamson, who's a curator in New Mexico in Albuquerque at the Natural History Museum. Tom is one of the world's experts on the first mammals that rose up and diversified after the dinosaurs died. You know, those mammals that are our ancestors that set the stage for our mammal-dominated world today. And I've gotten much more into those mammals. In fact, a lot of my research now is with Tom and with a great group of colleagues from around the world where we're really looking at how that happened. How did mammals cope with the asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs? How did they diversify afterwards? How quickly did that happen? Uh, what were the drivers of it? But that whole story is pieced together with fossils in large part from New Mexico, from the Badlands out there. And it is not inhospitable. It's actually a gorgeous place to work, but very isolated. You know, you forget really that you're in the United States when you're out there. I mean, you're so far away from anything. You think, my goodness, you know, you're in a country of whatever, 300 plus million people, hyper industrialized. And here you are in the middle of nature, in the middle of 
these, you know, rolling candy striped badlands that are just bursting with the bones and teeth of these ancient creatures. And there's something just very satisfying about that, about having that sense of adventure, about being able to walk around in those landscapes to get away from the whole bustle of the world of everything that, you know, humans are doing to change our planet so much to get, you know, to feel like you're getting away from that and to be able to walk around and just find these incredible fossils. That's something that makes paleontology very unique. And and that's one of the things that gets a lot of people interested in paleontology, especially a lot of students, just being able to have the chance to go out to amazing places around the world and discover things. And so, you know, I told some stories in the book of some of my fieldwork trips and stories about some of my colleagues. And I think those things really are the hook that get a lot of people interested in in paleontology. So many television documentaries, they're all built around the hunt. You know, these Indiana Jones explorers oftentimes going out into the desert. But as we see, you know, of course, it's not all Indiana Jones people anymore. It's this great diversity of men and women from around the world and a lot of younger people. But being able to find new things, find fossils that people have never, ever seen before is, is you know, again, I wish I had better words to describe it. I know I'm waffling a bit, and that's just because <laughs> I just don't have the words in my vocabulary to do it. You know, I can sit down and write this long book, 400 pages or whatever, but I just can't put into words what it's really like to be set loose in the Badlands and go out on the hunt for 65 million year old fossils. Mm. You know, this thing about oh, looping it back to contingency and the big picture, the big scope, the book starts. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge here that we haven't talked about really about dinosaurs at all on this call. <laughs> so, you know, the, the book starts before the dinosaurs and it starts, you know, you lay the, the you set the scene for the, you know, the, the catastrophic mass extinction that that sort of set the stage for dinosaurs to emerge millions and millions of years later and you you know throughout this book every every piece of the way it's it's fascinating to note how many of the great mysteries of the mesozoic era were you know have been solved to, with some sort of satisfactory provisional answer some some reasonable hypothesis uh, in the last few years you know as as this resolution has gotten so much finer in the data but nonetheless, this book is just riddled with these questions about evolutionary contingency and about, you know, why is it the dinosaurs outcompeted all of these other vaguely dinosaur-like things that were running around at the time? Why is it that we see this sort of changing of the guard between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous period and, the, you know, the kinds of dinosaurs that were inhabiting the landscape? You know, why is it that the avian dinosaurs survived at the end of the Cretaceous and even the like the four winged dinosaur birds didn't. And, and so there's this beautiful mystery in all of this that you're pointing into that, you know, this, this question mark, you know, and it's, it's that I think is also a huge piece of the, the fascination here, you know, that there's just no yeah. end to this story, yeah. this discovery. Yeah, that's what I feel. And, you know, and, and I tried to write the book in that way so that it was both a story, but also a mystery. And not a single mystery, you know, it's not a detective novel or something like that. But, you know, the overarching theme of the book is the evolution of dinosaurs, you know, where they came from, how they rose up to dominance, how some of them got to be so big, how others started to grow feathers and wings and evolved into the birds of today, and then how the rest of them died out. And, you know, that story arc is already there. I didn't have to invent it. The dinosaurs did it. I just tried to tell their story with justice. <laughs> um, but in doing so, you know, I did try to highlight a lot of the mysteries that are still out there because we know a lot about dinosaurs. We have learned so much over especially the last decade as this golden age has transpired, as people, women and men around the world, young people, China, South America, all across Europe, North America, Australia, even Antarctica, everywhere, Alaska, people are dinosaurs. We've learned so much. We can tell so much of their story now. I couldn't have really written this book 10 years ago when I was getting started, when I was, you know, a, a grad student. So we, we know the general gist of their story, um, but there are gaps in there and there are still mysteries. In some cases, we know what happened. Like, yes, the dinosaurs became dominant. You know, they started small as these 
humble, gangly, cat-sized sprinters way back 250 million years ago in the, you know, the chaos, the aftermath of the end Permian extinction. We know that. We know that somehow they rose up and they become th- became things like Brontosaurus and T-Rex. We know that they were living alongside a lot of crocodile-type animals and car-sized amphibians and other horrific creatures, you know, during their <laughs> early history. We know somehow they bested those animals, you know. So we have the, the story there, but we don't always know why. And there are some big mysteries that still need solving. I think we're, you know, some of the mysteries that I think people think of when they think of dinosaurs is, you know, did they evolve from birds? You know, why did they go extinct? Those kind of questions. And we more or less know the answers to those. But the mysteries that are out there now, I think, are even more fascinating. Like, how did dinosaurs rise up to dominance? How does a group become dominant? How does evolution do that? How do you go from nothing and then you have some some, you know, humble ancestors? How do you how do you go from that to a brontosaurus? You know, what what's the process there? Um, what the hell? What, yeah, yeah that, that exactly. like... and, and so, you know, and, and and how, you know, there was another mass extinction at the end of the Triassic as the tra- Triassic transitioned into the Jurassic. And it seems like that extinction was really critical in the story of the rise of dinosaurs. So this is when Pangaea, the supercontinent, started to break up. So as that continent started to crack uh, and the little bits of land started to move away from each other, a puzzle being kind of, you know, disassembled, uh, Lava came up through those cracks. You had big volcanic eruptions. Uh, it was only over a period of about 600,000 years, and there were four big pulses of these things. But uh, these eruptions, they remade the world. They not only did lava come out of these volcanoes, but all kinds of toxic, uh, horrible, nasty gases, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, methane, and these things raised the temperatures really quickly. There was a runaway uh, global warming episode lots of environmental change. And this seemed to kill off a lot of the early competitors to dinosaurs, a lot of these crocodile type animals, but the dinosaurs sailed right through. So it looks like that extinction was a big filtering event that triggered in a lot of ways, you know, dinosaurs being able to now in the aftermath of it, have a world that was free of a lot of their competitors. But why exactly? What was it about dinosaurs that allowed them to get through that extinction? And why were the crocs and the amphibians hit so hard? I mean, were dinosaurs special in some way? Could they run faster? Could they breathe more efficiently? Did they grow quicker? Did it was a difference in reproduction? Was it because some of them had feathers that helped them survive cold spells? I mean, maybe. <laughs> or was it dumb luck? You know, did they just walk away from this plane crash unscathed just by dumb chance? And we don't know. And that's a mystery, I think. It's one of the biggest mysteries that the next generation of paleontologists, the students that are out there now, they're going to have to solve that one. Mm. Yeah, maybe they just knew that, that they were going to get studied by Paul Serino. And <laughs> <laughs> that's what gave them the lead. You know, there's... I'm wearing a shirt that you can't see because we're not doing the video chat here, but let me let me turn the video on for you just for a second so you can appreciate this. Okay, T-Rexes of Texas. Okay, don't yeah, mess with T-Rexes. Don't T-Rexes. mess with T-Rexes. <laughs> I, I, I'm wearing that for you today, even though it's a dirty T-shirt, because you wrote this fabulous piece. I didn't even realize it was you until I reread the back of the book and saw that you're the one that had written the fabulous article on the cover of Scientific American about the evolutionary history of the Tyrannosauroidea. (laughs) And so, I mean, you've got, you you know, talking about contingency and this story of how this group of dinosaurs sort of just hung out in the background, uh, you know, fulfilling some sort of like coyote or fox ecological function for like 80 million years. And then suddenly is on is the the keystone predator of half of the planet, and you know that's just a it's a really beautiful piece. And if I would love to uh, give a special moment for you to talk about the tyrannosaurs because it's not only one of the the most sort of fun parts of the book, obviously because it's such a well studied animal and we know so much about it, but just because you know it's a crowd pleaser. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, T-Rex is the dinosaur icon. You know, it's the one everybody knows. It's the brand name. It's the McDonald's, the Disney, the Coca-Cola of dinosaurs. You know, you could show a picture of T-Rex, I think, to to almost anybody on the planet and they would know what it is. I mean, it's just got this signature look to it. It's got the enormous head, the 
the thick, robust jaws, the railroad spike teeth, the long body with the long tail balancing it out, the big muscular hind legs, the pathetic little forearms. It's just, you know, got a pull to it. And it was discovered you know, in the early 1900s. And when it was discovered out in, in Montana, you know, it made a sensation back in New York. It was the American Museum of Natural History that collected it and they brought it back and they put it on exhibit. And it was just this incredible thing to have a, a, a monster of that size. I mean, I can just imagine the, the, the crowds and, you know, 1905 New York just gawking at this this thing, this monster from from found buried in rocks out in the far western part of the country. And ever since then, of course, we've learned a lot about tyrannosaurs. People have been so interested in them because they are so awesome. Uh, that means that a lot of paleontologists have studied them. And thrown every sort of tool in the toolbox at tyrannosaurs. And because of that, we really do know more about T-Rex and other tyrannosaurs than we do about a lot of living animals. I mean, we know a lot about what T-Rex looked like. We know how big it was. We know how it grew. We know what it ate and how it ate. We know what kind of brain it had and what kind of lungs it had. Uh, we know how it changed from a, a, a youngster into an adult how its body was reshaped during that transition. We know so much about it. And that, I think, is just, it's amazing to think about it, that we, we have a 66-million-year-old dinosaur, and we know a lot more about it than a lot of, of, of modern animals, which means, in, in part, that there's still a whole lot to learn about our world today, and we shouldn't forget about that. But when it comes to T-Rex, I've studied it a lot. You know, I started studying tyrannosaurs when I was working with Paul Serino, actually, because he came to uh, acquire um, and repatriated to China a fossil that was illegally collected. And uh, it was a, a small tyrannosaur, and it turned out to be a new species uh, that we called Raptor Rex, which at the time we thought was like a pygmy tyrannosaur. We've learned more since then that it's probably just a, a very young juvenile of uh, another type of tyrannosaur. But that was my first experience with tyrannosaurs actually studying them. And then as a, a PhD student, that fossil that Mark Norell handed me, that skeleton, when I just started my first day of PhD, that was a tyrannosaur. That was a, a long snouted tyrannosaur that he collected in the Gobi Desert. And we called it a new species, Alia ramus remotus. Um, and that just kind of sparked my interest in tyrannosaur evolution because Alia ramus was a bit of a, a weird tyrannosaur. It was living right at the end of the Cretaceous, the same time T. rex was living in North America and the same time T. rex's cousin, Tarbosaurus, was living in Asia, basically the Asian version of T. rex. But Alia ramus was different. It was living in Asia with Tarbosaurus, but it was smaller and it had a really long snout and it had some horns on its snout. And so that just the weirdness of Alia ramus got me interested in the whole evolutionary story of tyrannosaurs. And I got to visit China a few times with Mark. I got to study some of the new tyrannosaurs that Xu Xing, the world's greatest dinosaur hunter uh, in China, um, that he was studying some of these fossils from Liaoning, the feathered dinosaur beds, also some other fossils from Western China that were even older. These were small dog to human sized tyrannosaurs that were old, that were Jurassic or early Cretaceous in age. These were the first tyrannosaurs. These were the sort of things that T-Rex evolved from. And it was really just a... Um, a strange feeling to have this box brought out, just kind of the sort of box you put like Christmas lights in, you know, that kind of size. <laughs> you can pick it up with two hands, no problem. And the whole skeleton of this primitive tyrannosaur, D-Long, fit into that box. I mean, if you if you wanted to lift up a T-Rex skeleton, well, that's impossible. I mean, that's <laughs> even if you just wanted to lift up the head of a T-Rex, you'd need a forklift to do that. But this whole animal, this basically this ancestral tyrannosaur, was something you could just, you know, lift up just like you're taking your Christmas lights out of the attic. And so that just inspired me to try to figure out, you know, how did tyrannosaurs evolve? How did evolution take these, these very humble animals living in the shadows of other giant predators way back in the Jurassic and 100 million years later kind of turn them into T-Rex type of animals? And so I've studied now a lot of the primitive tyrannosaurs. I've done a lot of work with one of my my good friends Thomas Carr, who's an expert on, on T-Rex and also an expert on tyrannosaur growth. And we've uh, come up with a new genealogy for tyrannosaurs, a big family tree, you know, based on all of our observations of all these fossils from around the world. 
And that's helped us piece together the story that really tyrannosaurs did start humbly. And for the first 80 million years of their evolution, they were small animals. They were mostly human size. They were rarely, if ever, larger than a horse during that time. But then during the final 20 million years of the age of dinosaurs, the very latest Cretaceous, something happened and tyrannosaurs supersized themselves. They got massive and they rose to the top of the food chain. We don't quite know why. It looks like some of the other giant predators that had been the incumbents in that ecological niche went extinct. So things like the allosaurs and the spinosaurs, a lot of the ceratosaurs, those things died out. And maybe that left space for a new group to rise up. But we've also seen some really tantalizing clues, this new species that I described a few years ago um, from Uzbekistan, a place I've never been to, but a place that my colleagues Sasha Avaranov in Russia and Hans Dieter Seuss in the U.S., they collected a lot of dinosaurs there in rocks that are from the middle Cretaceous, about 90 million years old, and they found part of the skull of a tyrannosaur, and it was the bones that surround the brain. So we could CT scan it and, and reconstruct what the brain looked like and what the ear looked like. And what we found was, was really interesting. This tyrannosaur was not very big. It was only horse size, but it had a really big brain. It had an ear that was really good at hearing a whole wide range of sounds. And those are also features in the big tyrannosaur. So it looks like that tyrannosaurs got smart before they got big and maybe becoming really intelligent at smaller size is one of the things that allowed them to grow to huge sizes and just become so utterly dominant at the top of the food chain. Until, of course, that one day, 66 million years ago, when T-Rex was there, and it would have seen, you would have had populations of T-Rexes living across Western North America that would have looked up into the sky and would have seen this flaming rock hurling through the atmosphere, and they would have been there to experience that. Mm. You know, you talk about on the back of this book <clears throat> that this story of the dinosaurs and specifically of the Cretaceous Paleogene impact extinction is uh, a story full of lessons for today as we confront a sixth mass extinction. And yet, like, you know, I was I was reading this book waiting for the moment where <laughs> we talk about what insights we can extract from this and when I look at this story and when I read your book, one of the things that comes up again and again and again, and you, you do get into this a little bit with the Cretaceous and, you know, why did certain animals survive while others died? You know, turtles and, and stuff, you know, they could, they were underwater, you know, they could burrow, they could remain kind of in, you know, burrowing mammals, everything that was kind of able to hide from the worst of it. But then there's this other common pattern in evolutionary history that seems like whenever there is a, uh, gap at the top you know whenever there's a mass extinction that sort of ups you know there's a trophic cascade and it upsets the entire food web that the it's the small smart generalists the omnivores the things that can survive on on bugs and detritus that really do that that do well and that there's an emphasis again on the sort of scrappy opportunist picking up in the wake of of the uh, the collapse of these complex ecosystems and so i don't know it just seems like maybe that's where that's where the insight is as far as like what are we looking for you know in the wake of the 2008 financial collapse for example and in the you know the the looming specter of an even greater global financial collapse and uh drastic climate change and you know all of these things that we're you know we're sort of aware that we're right on the cusp of ruining the entire ocean ecosystem with ocean yeah. acidification and it's like it's a it's a kind of a dark and messy place to end this conversation but <laughs> you know we are paleontologists right so we we find the horrible demise to our benefit you know, somebody's gruesome death is always like our wonderful discovery. So, so I'd love to hear, you know, I'd love to, uh, to hear what you think as, you know, as someone working in this field, how you understand the sort of modern day lessons of all of this stuff. Yeah. So, you know, I think dinosaurs are awesome. I mean, there's just no better way to say it. Dinosaurs are awesome. I mean, animals like T-Rex and Brontosaurus and Triceratops. I mean, you, you go to a museum, you stand underneath the skeletons of these animals and they're just mesmerizing. And to think that these things once lived, 
there's just a magic about that. And I think that's why people are interested in dinosaurs, really, because these are fantastic creatures. And I think they're more fantastic than pretty much anything humans have ever come up with in myths or legends, you know, dragons or unicorns or leprechauns or whatever. I think dinosaurs are cooler than those things. And dinosaurs were real. And that's the magic about them. But there's more to it than that. They're not just objects. Dinosaurs are clues. They're clues that tell us how evolution works and how the earth has changed over time. And ultimately, that's why I study dinosaurs, because they do provide information and they do provide lessons and lessons that might help us in our modern world, because our modern world is changing very, very fast. Climates and environments are changing at breakneck speed. And we're really struggling to figure out what to do with that. Studying dinosaurs isn't going to save the world, of course, but what dinosaurs and other fossils do is they tell us how real animals, real ecosystems have responded to real moments of climate and environmental change in the past. And what's going on in the world today is largely down to humans. You know, we're pumping all of this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But there have been other times in Earth history when volcanoes have pumped a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, or there have been other climate changes. So we can learn from these things. And what we see with dinosaurs, I think there's a couple of interesting lessons. First of all, I think the biggest one of all is, you know, the dinosaurs were us before we were on the Earth. That's maybe an awkward way to say it, but basically, you know, the dinosaurs were us, we are the dinosaurs. What I mean by that is, you know, the dinosaurs were dominant. They were the things that lived all over the planet, billions and billions of them living in almost every conceivable environment on land. They were at the top. We're at the top now. I mean, we live all over the planet. We're the, the dominant creatures on the planet. Now, dinosaurs, though, were around for over 150 million years, you know, even forgetting about birds, just thinking about the T-Rex, Brontosaurus types of classic dinosaurs. They were around for over 150 million years. Humans have been around for only about 200,000 years. So there's a perspective there. But more than that, the dinosaurs were around for so long. They were so successful. They grew to sizes, you know, some sauropods that shook the earth when they walked almost as big as a Boeing 737, you know, monstrous sizes. Others grew feathers and wings. Nature's ultimate success story. But then one day they died out and it was sudden and it was basically one day, geologically speaking, it was when that asteroid hit 66 million years ago, this six mile wide rock traveling faster than a jetliner smashed into Mexico with the force of over a billion Hiroshima bombs and instantaneously it set off a wave of wildfires and tsunamis and earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and hurricane force winds that reshaped the entire earth within a period of minutes hours, days, weeks. I mean, things changed fast and the dinosaurs could not cope, even though they had been on top for over 150 million years. So if it could happen to the dinosaurs, could it happen to us? And I think that's something we need to think about. But the other thing in a more kind of, you know, say a less philosophical way, in a more tangible way, is stu that studying dinosaurs and other fossils do give us some insight into what happens when climate and environment changes, what happens when there is an extinction. And you're absolutely right. It seems to be that a lot of the things that survive these extinctions are generalists. There are things that can eat a lot of different foods. There are things that are very adaptable. Usually that means they're smaller animals. Oftentimes it means they have a larger geographic range. There are things that can hide more easily. There are things that can tough it out in a period of, of, of sudden climate or environmental changes. So when the dinosaurs died, you know, birds and mammals survived. That's how we're used to thinking about it. And that's true in a technical sense. But in fact, most birds died with the other dinosaurs and most mammals died then too. I mean, mammals were pretty close to going extinct as well. And it was really only a few types of mammals that made it through that extinction. And these were mammals that were generally smaller and had more generalist omnivorous types of diets. And if those mammals didn't make it through, then we wouldn't be here today, of course. So we're linked to those mammals. We had ancestors that were there when the asteroid hit, ancestors that eked their way across that extinction into the next interval of geological time and then evolved into primates and eventually into humans. So that gives us a sense of what does happen when the world goes to crap. And I think that's a useful thing to know. And that's just one example. But there's many other things that fossils 
that paleontology, that geology tell us about our planet, about how our planet works, about our own place in our world, and maybe about what we can expect to happen as our planet changes. And that, to me, is why dinosaurs are more than just awesome creatures. They are very relevant things to study. Mm. Right on. Steve, <laughs> thank you so much. Steve Brusate, right? I'm pronouncing that correctly? Yes, Brusati. It doesn't matter. I, you know, everybody pronounces it a thousand different ways. It's a weird name, but Brusati is how we say it, Italian name. Yeah. Right on, man. The, the book is excellent. The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, A New History of a Lost World, coming out on uh, William Morrow. And yes, that's the publisher. Yep. It's one of the HarperCollins uh, imprints. And so I've just gotten the box of books. They just arrived here. So they've been printed They're, I mean, I know it's I don't want to, you know, flatter myself, but they're it, they're gorgeous. I mean, it's just an amazing thing to hold it in my hand. And the cover art is fantastic. Todd Marshall did the cover art, one of the best artists out there. It really um, is cool. And there's photos inside, a lot of photos of dinosaurs. A lot of those were taken by the person who I think is hands down the best dinosaur photographer in the world that's mick ellison in, in new york who's an artist who works a lot with mark norell and a good friend of mine and so you know it comes out in uh, on april 24th officially of course at this moment i don't know when this is going to air but at this moment right now you know it can be pre-ordered of course but soon it should be out there in bookshops and i hope i hope people like it you know because it's at this phase now where i'm just getting a little bit nervous just hoping that it's going to be a story that resonates with people and um, that people read it and enjoy it yeah well it resonated with me man thank you so much for being on the show people can follow you on twitter right is that the best way yes. to stay in touch that's the best way. So my Twitter handle is just my name. It's at Steve Brusati. So I'm um, easy enough to find. And, um, you know, I always love hearing from dinosaur enthusiasts all over the world. Uh, so get in touch. Uh, if, if you see the book, if you read it, if you like it, if you don't like it, uh, get in touch. I, I'd love to hear what you think. <laughs> awesome, dude. Thanks for being on the show. All right. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. And have a very nice uh, weekend. Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Future Fossils is part of the MindPod Network, along with Third Eye Drops, The Astral Hustle, Synchronicity Podcast, and an oodle of other fascinating programs. I encourage you to go to mindpodnetwork.com and subscribe to them all. And stay tuned, because we have some awesome episodes coming up on Future Fossils. So stick around and have a most excellent meal.